make sure I'm in focus. I was out of focus a week or two ago. <laughs> Visually, sharp as always, but mentally, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but out of focus visually. Anyway, well, um, let's see. So I would like to talk with you about anger. And it's in the context of what we've been exploring here of in this turbulent time, the value of, more than ever of finding refuge. Refuge is a traditional idea. We see it in traditions around the world. I think of little children finding refuge in their parents' lap, or kids playing hide-and-seek, finding refuge when they finally make it back to home base, Ali Ali auction, free, free, free. Uh, refuges are things that like places, such as wilderness, which is a major refuge for me. We can take refuge in ideas or bodies of wisdom, such as in science or in the spiritual traditions. Um, in the Buddhist tradition, uh, the three classic refuges are the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, which stands for the Buddha being the historical teacher, as well as the inner teacher within us all. Uh, Dharma is reality, what is true, what is actually the case, as well as accurate, useful accounts of what is the case, teachings, in other words, and refuge in Sangha, community, both its vertical dimension of teachers that we respect and its horizontal dimension of fellow practitioners, comrades, uh, along, the, uh, along the path. So these are refuges in general, and we've been exploring different kinds of refuges, including those that are informed by our modern neuropsychological understandings. And um, tonight I wanted to build on what we've explored to talk about anger, which is a very powerful force Anger can be uh, very energizing. It can spotlight injustice. Uh, it can heighten our awareness of ways in which we've been mistreated or ways that others have been disrespectful. It can highlight our sense of broader kinds of injustice, such as systemic, systematic forms of mistreatment of others, oppression of others. Um, so anger has its usefulness, but it also is a very potent force that can sweep us away and both create a fair amount of suffering for us internally and lead to trouble with other people. Uh, when I reflect on uh, things I regret in my history with other people, uh, a very large fraction, probably most of my mistakes I consider, or what I consider to be mistakes um, with other people, involved my anger in some way. So it's a very rich subject, and um, I'd like to enter into this subject uh, by reading a little bit from my book, Neurodharma. And also, I encourage you, if you like, in the chat to explore your own you know, reactions to anger, what is making you frustrated, exasperated, annoyed, irritated, miffed, <laughs> pissed off, whatever it might, you know, uh, just outraged, stunned sometimes at, at different things in our politics, perhaps. Um, so you might want to reflect yourself uh, in ways large and small that anger um, is a significant subject for you. I think it's a significant subject for every anyone, and certainly it was a significant subject for the Buddha. Okay, so... I want to uh, read this part from the book, Neurodharma. It's in the uh, second of seven practices, um, you know, that has to do with awakening, uh, the second practice, uh, warming the heart. And in that chapter that's about that second practice, there's a section called omitting none, which is a way to speak about anger. So please bear with me as I uh, read this from my book. Omitting none. Until about 10,000 years ago, and the gradual introduction of agriculture, our human and tool-making hominid ancestors lived in small bands, typically with several dozen members. These bands often competed with another for scarce resources. Bands that were better at cooperation and caring for us, at compassion, bonding, language, teamwork, trust, altruism, and love, were more able to pass on their genes. And 
bands that were better than others at fearing and fighting with them, at distrust, disdain, ill will, and vengeance, were also more able to pass on their genes. The benefits of both kinds of capabilities have been a major driver of the evolution of the brain over the last several million years. Two wolves. Consequently, to paraphrase a parable, in each person's heart are two wolves, one of love and one of hate, and everything depends upon which one we feed each day. The wolf of hate is in our nature. We can't kill it, and hating it just feeds it. Besides, it has characteristics that are sometimes useful. Anger is energizing, and it shines a bright spotlight on mistreatment and injustice. Many people have had their well-deserved anger suppressed or punished, including by systemic social forces. We need to make room for anger inside ourselves and to understand why we're angry. Similarly, we need to have room for anger in others and understand why they're angry, sometimes with us. Still, anger is a seductive and potent force. Most people don't like feeling anxious, sad, or hurt. <clears throat> but the hot rush of anger can feel so good. It's your fault. Of course I got mad. You deserve it. In the brain, interestingly, unlike any other form of so-called negative emotion, anger draws on dopamine and norepinephrine to feel rewarding for you. But other people could be reeling and making decisions with lasting consequences. Dumping anger on others is like throwing hot coals with bare hands. Both people get burnt. Most of my mistakes in relationships have begun with my anger. Nonetheless, anger itself is not ill will, the will to hurt, to tear down and eliminate. If anger is a yellow flag, ill will is full red. This aspect of the wolf of hate is sneaky and powerful. It's so easy to feel aggrieved and then spiteful and vengeful. Or simply cast others aside. They don't matter. It's all right to use them. No need to take them into account. Martin Buber described two fundamental types of relationships, I-thou and I-it. When we regard people as an it to our I, it, it's easy to overlook, discard, or exploit them. Consider what it feels like to be itted by others, treated like someone who doesn't matter, who is just a means to their ends. That's what it feels like for them to be itted by us. Throughout history and in the world today, whether in one-to-one -one relationships or among groups and nations, the destructive potential of the wolf of hate is obvious. We cannot remove this part of ourselves, but we can be clear-eyed about its origins and its power. And we can be mindful of how quickly it can, start, it can start sniffing about and snapping at others. And we can restrain and guide it while feeding the wolf of love. So it's in this context that I'd like to talk with you about anger, both neuropsychologically and uh, in the Buddhist framework, and in particular explore with you ways to manage it. So the exploration of anger in a Buddhist frame relates to what are sometimes called the three poisons, uh, which could be perhaps better translated as the three fuels of the fire of suffering and craving. Interestingly, a quick side point uh, and a you know, tip of the hat to Stephen Batchelor, a teacher, a Buddhist teacher, who has pointed out that while in the formulation of the Four Noble Truths, uh, it is seen that craving is the source of suffering. It's actually the case as well that when we suffer, when we feel bad, when we feel hurt, when we feel mistreated, when we're frustrated, that can lead to craving. In other words, suffering can foster craving. 
much as craving can foster suffering. And I think this way of understanding it opens things up for our own mindfulness. We can start watching what comes first, including in, in vicious cycles. You know, Maybe we begin by some form of desire that leads to suffering, which fosters more craving, which creates more suffering, which then fosters even more clinging and grasping and attachment in problematic kinds of ways. So we have these three fuels. What are the three fuels? The three classic poisons or fuels. They're variously translated as hatred, greed, and delusion. Hatred is a really powerful word, and um, it has to do with our reactivity to what is unpleasant. Greed has to do with our reactivity to what is pleasant, and delusion or ignorance has to do with the ways in which we mistake things that are transient for something that might last. Uh, ignorance or delusion is also involved when we think that things will be continue to be satisfying when in fact their satisfaction or their satisfactoriness keeps falling through our fingers like sand and when we can uh, make the mistake of believing that there's some kind of entity inside us, a self, uh, that must be protected and glorified. So those are forms of delusion. I want to talk here about aversion. Aversion as a basis for so-called hatred. And this takes us into the well-understood territory in biology and psychology of one way to respond to um, challenges through fighting, fleeing, or freezing. Essentially, fighting is aversion plus aggressiveness, attack. Fleeing is aversion plus withdrawal. And freezing is aversion plus immobilization. So this is a way to kind of expand the you know, traditional one poison of hatred into its three components of anger, fear, and helplessness. And the point of these teachings is not didactic. This is not some kind of class in you know, school or college where we're you know, wanting to get a grade. These are pointing out instructions in a rich wisdom tradition that we can draw upon to understand ourselves more deeply and to understand others as well. So here we have the general territory of anger, which is on a spectrum, really, from very mild forms of being miffed or exasperated to you know, stronger forms of irritation or annoyance to even stronger forms of being really mad, fiery, outraged, even enraged. There's a spectrum here of anger. On the one hand, anger has positive qualities. It's energizing. As a therapist, I would really rather, you know, not rather, it's, how can I put it? Uh, someone who's angry, there's energy you can work with. Someone who's depressed, in some ways, sometimes what helps the process of healing is to move from depression into anger. Because in some ways, sometimes, depression is bottled up anger. It's not the only explanation for depression, but it's often a factor. So anger has a place. And I want to be really clear, especially as a, you know, a white middle-aged man uh, who's had a lot of advantages and privileges, um, I think it's really important to be very careful about uh, not misusing teachings related to the risks and pitfalls of anger. It's very important to not use those to suppress our own appropriate, appropriate indignation at mistreatment or to use these teachings to you know, aid and abet forces, historic forces even, that have tended to muzzle or shame or suppress the very legitimate, appropriately righteous anger of those who've been uh, mistreated. So I want to be really careful about that. Um, so uh, in that context then, and I've got some notes here that I'm looking down at, um, I want to invite you into a, a reflection here about some of the uses, the good uses, of anger. Okay. So for yourself, how might it be appropriate 
if you think about some of the people in your life, you know, close at hand, maybe teenagers you're raising. I'm thinking back on when our kids were teenagers. Um, maybe a partner, maybe a friend. And you can expand it outward then, if you like, into groups in society. Maybe groups of people that are not like you and maybe even you're a little uncomfortable around and yet when you really look closely at it, yeah, there's some good reasons why they're mad. So I just wanna pause here for a moment or so as you, for a few moments, as you reflect upon people in your life, maybe some people you have conflicts with, it's messy maybe, and ask yourself, you know, can you understand some of their anger with you? Or can you understand more deeply some of their anger with others? It's actually helpful, isn't it? To, in your heart, make, make some room for, you know, the issues other people have and not, you know, shoot the messenger. Maybe the issue is wrapped in with some top spin, you know, there's some heat behind it. They didn't say it perfectly. Maybe they didn't say it clearly. And yet, you know, intuitively, if you step back, big picture, you take a breath, go, well, you know, <laughs> you can understand why they've got a complaint, maybe. An unmet need, a disappointment with you, some way you just rub them the wrong way, even innocently. There are people in my life for whom my strengths rub them the wrong way. That's interesting. You know, sometimes it's our, it's our virtues, including our pursuit of solutions to problems or uh, better ways to care for others that still can rub some people the wrong way. And it doesn't mean we necessarily shouldn't be what we're being, but we can understand better. Oh, oh. Given all the causes and conditions in that person's life, oh, I can understand why um, they feel that way. You know, just opening it up. It doesn't mean to, this reflection is not about um, countenancing or you know, putting up with mistreatment of yourself that's inappropriate. I'm just looking at that aspect of reality that might maybe have to do with some legitimacy in the anger of others that would be helpful to open up to and to maybe even resource yourself into being able to stay more present with without immediately becoming aversive yourself to the aversion of others. That's a reflection. Another kind of reflection here in terms of positive qualities of anger, uh, is there wisdom for you in your own anger? <laughs> you know, is your own anger telling you some useful things? Things you're, you've kind of had it with, you're fed up about, or are recurring grievances, maybe with another person, recurring annoyances or frustrations. Maybe you've internalized a suppression of your own anger, your own fieriness, your own sense that that's not right. In this reflection, can you make more room for your own anger? Is there a teaching for you in things that have irritated you or annoyed you or made you mad in the present? Maybe mad on behalf of others. Sounds like a cliche, but it's deeply wise. Can we honor our own anger without being swept away by it in problematic ways, which I'll be getting to? In my family growing up, my parents had a monopoly on anger, expressed anger. So I really, really, really bottled it up. And I had to learn 
to have the capacity to go to the full expression of anger. And interestingly, as I acquired that capacity in a bunch of human potential workshops in my 20s a while ago, <laughs> as I acquired that capacity, I learned over time that I didn't have to go there because I knew I could. Something like uh, someone who has a you know a advanced degree in karate or something like that, Aikido, who because they know they could deal with others, don't have to be aggressive. So, and also, think about wise anger with yourself. This is a little tricky because it can become a slippery slope into toxic self-criticism or self-shaming. But sometimes we just know we shouldn't do stuff and we're irritated with ourselves or we're irritated with ourselves that we don't just fill in the blank. We don't pick up the thing to do. We don't pick up the phone to call someone when we should. You know, We don't bring our best work. We don't... Um, exercise, you know, we don't regulate what we put in our bodies or our minds, you know, maybe there's some wisdom in this reflection for you about, um, you know, being annoyed with yourself. Is there one thing to, to take away here for yourself from, you know, being irritated with yourself? I have a list for me. <laughs> okay. Also, in this reflection I'm inviting you into, and here is, and I speak as someone who's not trained in Tibetan Buddhism and has much respect for what I'm learning about it, uh, there's this notion of anger um, um, that in which one appreciates the passion in it. There are these elements in Tibetan Buddhism, wrathful deities. These are seen as potent demigod-like figures who are wrathful, and in their wrathfulness is some wisdom and energy that we can draw upon. So one way to practice with anger is to recognize the passion in it while also seeing the emptiness of the experience the insubstantiality of it, its cloud-like qualities, you know, disentangling, unwrapping, um, airing out the anger, passion through insight, through insight, not being swept away by it, not identifying with it, not making it into a thing that we possess or identify with, but rather having insight into the passion of anger, recognizing its cloud-like qualities, right, and the, its ownerlessness, because where we really get into trouble with anger is when we identify with it. I hate that, right? How dare you treat me like that? You know, that's where we really get into trouble. And this form of insight, and in, in this, this is a kind of tantric in a sense. I'm using that term poorly and loosely. But in a kind of loose tantric sense, we feel the passion as an aid to our practice. But if we are to use this passion in anger wisely, the intensity of it, the fieriness of it, we really need to raise our game to sustain ongoing insight into its empty cloud-like nature and continually disidentify from it rather than claiming it as our own. Last, in terms of positive features of anger, is there action to take? One of the functions of anger is to mobilize action. That's one of its adaptive functions. And we share the capacity for anger with other mammals, certainly. Uh, there is circuitry in the brainstem, basically, or the lower brain regions uh, of a cat that uh, is very much like our own. And if Scientists put a little, you know, a little electrode into that region of the brain of a cat and stimulate it. The cat will go into a rage reaction. And interestingly, as a detail, it, we must stimulate a different region for the cat 
to chase a mouse or something that looks like a mouse. In other words, intense pursuit, passionate pursuit is not the same as rage. And that's very interesting. You know, I think of it back when I was playing tennis poorly. You know, sometimes my opponent would rush the net and I would just rah, rip a topspin forehand right at him. I typically played against uh, other men. And um, I wasn't mad at him, but boy, did I want to like rip that top, you know, that, that forehand right at his body because that was the hardest part, you know, to deal with. There's a distinction between intense pursuit of our goals and getting angry meanwhile. And that's a very helpful thing to decouple, uh, including drawing upon this insight from you know, the neurology of a cat. So the point is, we have this capacity for anger and related intensities. Uh, they serve adaptive functions to move us into action. So here's a final reflection on the positive aspects of anger for you. Is there a takeaway here for you? One takeaway from tonight where you might think to yourself, my anger, broadly defined, from subtleties of annoyance to just being freaking appalled, my anger is moving me to one action at least. Maybe you, you've just had it with how someone treats you uh, and you're ready to move on. Or maybe you realize to yourself, um, I need to get more allies or resources to deal with this issue. It's an ongoing aggravation. I need to get a legal opinion. I need to investigate what the rules are, the licensing boards. You know, I need to do so. I need to find out. I need to call my insurance company. What do I need to do here? Take action. Or maybe it's really kind of simple. Maybe your anger is telling you, you know, I'm just not going to enter into that kind of conversation again with that person. There's no cheese in that tunnel. So. A moment of reflection now. What's an action that your anger is teaching you right now to take? Okay. And then, of course, there's the other aspect of anger. Now that we've explored its benefits, the ways that it can be really helpful in terms of spotlighting and energizing. Uh, it's a signal. It's like a loud bell, bong, bong, bong. Pay attention to this. Uh, also though, anger afflicts us and burdens us. Because of the reward value of anger, because of the fact that anger feels good uh, often, especially compared to feeling sad or hurt or inadequate, ashamed, because anger is rewarding with those dopamine and norepinephrine factors, it's especially important to recognize its costs. For me, there was a real shift when I, um, and by the way, I'm not trying to say that anger always feels good to everybody, but very interestingly, unlike many other negative emotions, um, it, it has a rewarding quality sometimes. So it's helpful to appreciate the ways in which anger is an affliction on us. We feel so justified in our anger, right? Anger has a lot of power to sweep us away with its rewardingness, its energizingness. We can feel organized by our anger, especially if we tend to dissociate and get spacey. Um, people can get very attached to their anger because it makes them feel strong, makes them feel like a person, makes them feel like they're here. Because anger is rewarding, we have to be especially careful about it and recognize the way it afflicts us and creates conflicts and issues with others. So with regard to that part of you know, tonight, I would you know, want to reflect here. Are there boundaries that you might want to set with regard to the anger of others coming at you? Where you basically say no. Don't talk to me like that. Or, you know, where you just disengage. Or you ask others, please tell me what you want, you know, so I can resolve things here rather than you just shouting at me. Are there boundaries perhaps to set? An interesting boundary is to consider setting. Um, limits on consumption of political media. 
that is performative outrage. I understand the outrage, <laughs> I validate it, and yet it's like marinating in helpless outrage, and that's not good for us. So maybe a little bit of that is useful, but is there a boundary perhaps to set there? So. Also in a reflection, can you restrain, restrain your expression of anger while also communicating what is underneath it? The ways in which you have an unmet need, ways you have felt hurt, ways you have felt mistreated, maybe ways you long to connect with another person but in different ways. Is there a takeaway here for you? For myself, when our kids were little, um, so I'm a pretty mellow guy, but I also realized, wow, children are annoying. Oops. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes, right? And so what do you do with that? And I, I you know, because I, I didn't grow up in a very regulated household in a lot of ways. I, I had to learn to regulate myself. And so I, I, one thing I did is I took on a pledge. Uh, for me, it was a kind of vow not to speak or act from anger. And so it gets very interesting. If you're not speaking or acting from anger, what do you do with it? You gotta feel it. You have to learn from it, right? It's a teacher, but how do you regulate yourself? And what it did with my family, and I, I try to do this with other people as well, it um, forces us to find the deeper truth. It draws us to slow down with others. If we take that particular vow, we feel it, but we don't act from it. We may name it, but we don't dump it, right? And if you take up that discipline upon yourself or for yourself, um, what it has done, at least for me, is it's led me to be more heartfelt with other people, more open-hearted, more open about the ways I feel hurt or I wish for something different rather than accusing or blasting other people. So, you know, it's interesting to explore how to uh, include anger in our consciousness while not dumping it on other people. So I'd like to finish here uh, and open it up for your questions and comments in the chat. Uh, if I can, I'll probably take one person. I see that Ian Borgman has raised, raised his hand. Um, and so, and by the way, if I ever get a personal pronoun wrong, you know, and I'm happy to address people, I want to address people however they want to be addressed. So if I get anything wrong, including mispronouncing your name or anything, please let me know. <laughs> okay, good. So last, I just want to point out that in that meditative practice, we explored the sense of things as a whole while feeling open-hearted, peaceful, and content. And if you think about it, all four of those, the big picture, open-heartedness, calm, and contentment, all of them tend to settle down the wolf of hate and feed the wolf of love. So two quotations from the Buddha as I finish here, and we'll open it up to you. And see other people have raised their hands. I may not, I won't be able to get to everybody, that's for sure. Uh, this is from, th these are two quotations from the Pali Canon. From Udana, with regard to equanimity. Whose mind is like rock, steady, unmoved, dispassionate for things that spark passion, unangered by things that spark anger, when one's mind is developed like this, from where can there come suffering and stress? In other words, when we're stabilized in a deep, deep equanimity in our core, like a deep, deep keel of a sailboat, yes, the winds of life blow, yes, passing reactions may arise still in a mind that is not yet irrevocably and entirely enlightened, and I'm not there yet myself, Stuff can arise, but it doesn't invade and remain. 
And in the core of it all, like a rock or like a peaceful pond, we are unmoved by greed or hatred. Second quotation from Samyutta Nikaya. Slay anger and you will be happy. Slay anger and you will not sorrow. For the slaying of anger in all its forms, with its poisoned root and sweet sting, that is the slaying that noble ones praise. With anger slain, one weeps no more. There's this metaphor there uh, from the Buddha, sometimes translated a little differently, as anger with its honeyed tip and poisoned barb. Okay, so much here. Uh, we'll see what makes sense to talk about next time. I see hands raised, so I'm going to scroll through the screens. I need to do a little thing to uh, enable someone to be unmuted. Uh, I'm going to mute all. I'm going to allow you now to unmute yourselves. Please don't unless I call on you, okay? And um, so now I am looking for a hand that is raised uh, in the feature in Zoom. I may miss you. I hope to see you. Uh, one person. There are a lot of people here. <laughs> I do not see the person who raised their hand. So, okay, I'm going to do this a little differently. So, be it. No worries. Do, do, do. I see you all. You're back here. Um, okay, I'm going to the chat, and I'm looking for questions that I can speak to. Oh, you can see lots and lots of uh, great comments in the chat. And if the chats are distracting to you, just push the chat button in Zoom, and the chats will disappear. You can also move the Zoom window so that the chats are off screen. Um, so let's see. Oh, lots of wonderful comments. I'm seeing if there's a question here. Um, Robert. Lots of questions. Okay, so I'm gonna try to reply. With regard to the meditation that we did, uh, it's a really neat meditation and you can do it really quite briefly once you get used to it. Breathing while feeling your chest as a whole breathing while feeling caring, breathing while feeling cared about, breathing while feeling peaceful, breathing while feeling content. That sequence draws upon all three fundamental ways to rest in a sense of enoughness already, which undermines the engine of craving and suffering that results through an underlying felt sense of an enoughness of safety, satisfaction, and connection, thus peacefulness, contentment, and love, while also opening out into the bigger picture, which is also calming and centering. And there's a fair amount of neuroscience about that in my book, Neurodharma. So those are the five breaths, and it's just a really neat, quite powerful meditation. And if you do it one breath after another, once you're used to it, it takes less than a minute and is really quite centering. Okay, so... Um, okay, so I'm going to take a question in the chat from Julian, a uh, question for Rick. Um, what do I have to say about people who have so-called anger issues but are recalling and dealing with the symptoms of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, particularly complex PTSD, repeated stressful trauma, traumatic experiences, especially when young, as a result of adverse childhood experiences? Really a, a beautiful question. Um, also a question came in earlier, if I could speak to the Enneagram point eight of the nine types identified in the Enneagram personality system. One of them is the eight, which could be described as the expanded anger point, uh, kind of a warrior 
type person. Um, one of my Enneagram teachers uh, was, was an eight, and he, he laughed about himself. He said, people used to tell me I had, a, I had an anger issue, and I finally realized they had an issue with my anger. But I didn't have an issue with my anger. I liked my anger. So um, sometimes we have anger for a good reason. You know, and sometimes anger stays with us. And one of the things that's been very helpful for me in this life um, uh, is to become comfortable, more comfortable with people who are understandably pissed off or who are just by tendency have readier access to anger and aggressiveness and a warrior-like temperament. And And I've tried to help myself feel more comfortable with people who are just like that. They're not mad at me. You know, and I, I don't have to be so afraid of it. So um, it's really interesting when we have anger in us, which can mobilize us in positive ways to Julian and to everyone to deal with ways we've been mistreated. And it's if anger is where we start, though, it is not where we where we end. Because under the anger, always, always is some obstruction to goal attainment, some frustration, some discrimination or prejudice as an obstruction to goal attainment, uh, some feelings of hurt, feeling let down or betrayed by other people, including by people who should have been allies, who should have come through for us in all, in all kinds of ways, in our families, in our schools, in our society. So anger is a teacher. It's where we start, but it's not where we end. And that's why it's very, very valuable to listen to and resource ourselves to become open to what else is present, not as a spiritual bypass, not as a inauthentic turning of the other cheek or wanting to be the meek who inherit the earth. Yes, <laughs> if we can get to that authentically, great. But meanwhile, you know, we want to listen to our anger. But that said, what's underneath that anger? What, what is softer? What is more vulnerable? What is scarier? to feel what might be scarier to talk about actually with those today who are safe to talk about this with. So that's what I would I would just say about that. And to be able to recognize anger in a sense in the symphony of consciousness, the various instruments playing, anger, (laughs) pick your instrument, uh I don't know, for me, bagpipes <laughs> are always very stirring, maybe because I'm Scottish, and, <laughs> at least my father's heritage. Um, and so, you know, you, you, or you might think of a pounding drum. Yes, it is one instrument in the symphony of consciousness, but don't let it be the only instrument, right? What else is playing, including maybe the softer woodwinds of hurt and sorrow and loss? So it's really important to include those, to include those. Okay, and I want to see if there's maybe one more question or comment that I can speak to from the chat, and then um, uh, we'll finish up here at half past the hour. So let's see here. Right. So, okay, so Christopher, uh, Johanna's iPad to everyone, and if you say something to everyone, I'll I'll name you because others can see you in the chat. It says, how do you avoid unhelpful marinating type anger to do with being on the receiving end of daily microaggressions where the folks dishing it out don't or won't usually get that what they're doing or saying needs to be looked at in some way? Yeah. So helpless anger is um, an experience we can have and one, though, that is very toxic to mental health, helpless, frustrated, immobilized anger. It can be what we feel. And some of the treatments of trauma have to do with helping people find ways to act out what would have been so good to have been able to do, to have been able to fight or to flee or to speak uh, or to have others come in who are helpful when we were being mistreated. So part of the treatment, part of the healing, of that kind of bottled up, understandably, Im- helpless, immobilized, uh, you know, frustrated outrage is to find ways to have it flow and to bring agency into it. So I want to be clear. I'm not saying there's something that we should not feel about helpless anger. It's a something we feel sometimes, but it's really not good for us to marinate in it. 
you know? And so what do we do about that? And there are different ways to deal with this, obviously. Uh, action is really important because anger wants to act. It wants to mobilize us into some form of coping that's skillful. So we want to look for skillful acting. Maybe what we do is we act by reducing our vulnerabilities to those people, right? Uh, I'm thinking of the Jean-Paul Sartre quote, hell is other people, you know, at least some other people. I get it. Uh, you know, maybe they're just simply clueless. Maybe they're deliberately clueless. Maybe they like doing this sort of stuff, you know. Can we take action so we're not so helpless? Can we get away from them? Can we speak up? Can we name what's happening uh, in real time? You know, that's an action we can take. Can we take action to turn to others and ask them to step in or stand up for us or at least see what we're seeing, even if we can't really do anything about it, right? That releases us from that, help, from that helplessness. It also, I think, is useful to see the bigger picture to see the ways in which humans, given our hunter-gatherer backgrounds, evolved to be biased. I'm not saying that to defend bias, but I'm saying it to broaden out our own inquiry with it. We are naturally biased. So the question is not whether we're biased. The question is whether we're conscious of our bias and whether we regulate our bias and whether we do the work ourselves to gradually free ourselves of bias. So that's true for us. It's also true for others. And for me, it, it's helpful to see this in a bigger way, you know, to see the, um, the historic endlessness of bias and discrimination and mistreatment and aggression and all the rest of that, to put it in a larger frame, uh, to see it in a bigger picture. And for me, at least that helps me see it in a larger light from more of a bird's eye view. It doesn't mean to defend it, in some ways, it's to embed it in a deeper critique, really, and a deeper appreciation of how important it is to change large-scale social factors that are enlisted by our bias uh, to oppress others and enable bias to be acted out uh, through various forms of disadvantaging others that are systemic and deeply unfair. You know, it's, For me, it's helpful to kind of appreciate this, this bigger picture. Um, and in the appreciation of the bigger picture, I, I actually find that we kind of suffer less individually. And then the last thing I'll just finish here is the classic teaching, the classic teaching of compassion for ourselves, for the ways that we're wounded and hurt and mistreated and messed with and dealt a bad hand. Compassion for those things, for the ways they're true. And compassion, you know, for others. Doesn't mean we agree with them or approve of them, but we see their suffering too. And for our own sake, for sure, maybe also out of a moral benevolence for others, but for our own sake, and you can feel the value of it, we practice with expanding our heart, you know, to, to, to claim a fundamental freedom in ourselves to rest in a field of lovingness that radiates in all directions, omitting none. And the passing of people through that field is not dependent on them because our radiating of lovingness, our abiding as lovingness is unconditional. We're increasingly centered in it, kind of like being a Wi-Fi base station. <laughs> That's radiating lovingness in all direction, no, no matter what computers pass through its field or phones or other devices. And in that is a deep freeing, a deep freeing. Okay, let's sit for a minute here and just let it settle out. Whatever's useful will sink in. The rest you can let go of.
I'm going to finish now by ringing the bell three times. Thank you all. Take good care.